Howdy, everyone. This episode is brought to you by Fireblocks. Love, love, love this company. You'll be hearing all about them later from me later in the episode. But now, on with the show. What's up, everybody? Mike here. This was a really important episode for me. And before we get into it, I just want to provide an extra 30 seconds of context for you. Jeff, Alex, Greg, and I recorded this last week on February 8th about the ongoing saga around GoFundMe and the Freedom Convoy protests that are going on in Canada. Since then, there have been a couple of updates. Monday of this week, Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau introduced the Emergencies Act, which allows the government to temporarily ban public assembly and restrict travel from specific areas. They also announced that crowdfunding platforms and the payment service providers linked to them, including crypto, must register with FinTrack, expanding the Proceeds of Crime and Terrorist Financing Act. I'm giving you this context for two reasons. One, we talked a lot about the Freedom Convoy, GoFundMe, and the link to Bitcoin, and that has changed uh, since last week. We've had some updates, so I just want to make sure you've got the most up-to-date information. And two, I just wanted to frame the context of the episode. As you're listening to Greg, Jeff, and Alex, I think it would be helpful to frame the conversation, not just in terms of do I agree with these truckers, but on three different dimensions. One, How should Western governments react to protests in 2022? Particularly when it comes to government, I think the right way to look at this is in terms of precedent, i.e., would I like it if this became a regular occurrence? Two, how should the financial system be used as a tool of control? Especially, do I think it's okay that governments can cut off financial access to different groups of people in society? And three, how has the media covered all this? Ultimately, I think it's important that everyone on this show forms their own opinions and does their own research. I'll just say that for me, it was really instructive to do some research on the Occupy Wall Street movement and how that was covered back in the day in 2011. So anyway, I hope this was some helpful context. Now on with the show. Financial censorship is is one of the key ways through which governments will attack the ability to protest. They did it in Hong Kong. They tried to do it here. They're going to try to do it everywhere. Our individual rights and freedoms are lost on a on a concentration of that power and i and bitcoin is actually the only thing that i've seen that restores that balance gofundme just provided the use case for bitcoin all right everyone welcome back to another episode of on the margin uh, today i'm joined by the most people that have ever been on the show uh, we've got a big topic to discuss uh jeff booth and greg foss uh returning and alex gladstein returning as well guys welcome back to the show thanks michael thanks for having us yeah. yeah, pleasure to be here from Canada. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Um, all right, so today we're going to be covering uh, the Freedom Convoy, um, a whole bunch of different topic areas to get into there, but we're going to be covering what's going on in Canada, uh, what kind of the core message is, how it's spreading to the rest of the world. And I want to dig in especially to the GoFundMe campaign that got canceled uh, and how we've got some crypto-native, uh, Bitcoin-native alternatives that are supporting kind of the truckers. So I think it would be really helpful to just start off with kind of a background and overview of what the Freedom Convoy protests are. Are. Greg, I know you're sort of our on the ground man, <laughs> boots on the ground man uh, over there. You want to just give us an overview of what's going on? So Ottawa is approximately, it's central Canada. It's uh, closer to the East Coast than it is to the West Coast. But a trucker uh, convoy was organized from both sides of the uh, country to meet in Ottawa and converge on Ottawa. I think it was 11 or 12 days ago now. And it was logistically planned so that uh, they had support, uh, you know, it was advertised and there was support all along the highways. As a Canadian, I can tell you some of those uh, videos that I saw truly brought a tear to my eye because Canada hasn't been this proud or I've never seen as many Canadian flags being waved since, uh, you know, the last time I did, Jeff, was when we won the gold medal in the Olympic Mm -hmm. hockey, right? So this is a, uh, an event that, uh, uh, truly Canada needed because, you know, we were being fractured. Um, and it doesn't hurt that it was winter in Canada. Um, and some of these places were literally minus 25 degrees Celsius, which is for you Americans, that's below zero Fahrenheit, substantially below zero Fahrenheit. And there's hundreds and thousands of people on overpasses waving flags and uh, with children with signs. Um, anyway, it was uh, a, a movement that, Uh, descended on Ottawa uh, two Saturdays ago and um, it was uh, well planned the truckers got there on time Uh, many citizens who you know joined the uh, the protest and to be clear you know there's people that are making this out as anti-vax specifically anti-mandate and the way I like to describe it is it's more pro-freedom okay Um, I've made it 
well known that I've, you know, I've taken the vaccine. Uh, but I also have a daughter who's, uh, you know, uh, 21 years old. She's not trying to get pregnant, but if she was trying to get pregnant, let's just say, I hope she's not trying to get pregnant. Um, that uh, she, if if she didn't want to take the va- the vaccine, um, I would be in agreement with that. So, what happened was they all descended on Ottawa. I'll, I'll get into Jeff and my involvement if you want to later, but they all descended on Ottawa. And I saw this as an opportunity to support the freedom movement. Again, I'm not going to align myself with a political party or with a anti-vax mandate specifically, but freedom, freedom of speech, freedom isn't free. Could Bitcoiners become involved? And I reached out to Jeff and I said, there's an opportunity, I think here, Jeff, I have this guy, Boots on the Ground, whom, whom I mentioned, and he he goes by the Twitter handle at Nobody Caribou, but Bitcoin Magazine actually snapped a photo of him walking around two Saturdays ago with a placard over his head that said, opt out, buy Bitcoin. And I'm like, damn, I'd only met him virtually because he had a podcast that I got on uh, about a year ago. I go, is this my guy, Nick? And sure enough, it was. And I said, Nick, let's get a wallet address set up. We'll start taking Bitcoin donations. And uh, I reached out to Jeff and Jeff agreed to be a, a, a party. And this was before the GoFundMe uh, unraveled. So I think that's probably an introduction as well as I can give. One last thing I'd like to say, this is a peaceful protest. Uh, So far, the results have been absolutely incredible. Zero material material arrests. Uh, We have way more arrests after a Stanley Cup uh, disappointment in either Vancouver or Montreal than than we've had at any of these uh, uh, demonstrations. So I think the truckers are trying to make it a peaceful protest, but let's be honest, these are big rigs. They are there to stay. They are causing disruptions in the city and it's becoming a polarizing event. So uh, that's where the situation is right now. There are about 160,000 truckers, from my understanding, that ferry on a regular basis between Canada and the United States. Some of them are U.S. citizens, some of them are Canadian citizens. There's an agreement reached between the governments uh, about four months ago, back in October of this past year, that uh, ultimately they wanted frontline workers to be vaccinated, but they weren't going to mandate anything for the next four months because that was a period they didn't want to add any strain to the existing challenges within the supply chain. And trade is obviously a huge factor between Canada and the U.S., um, and my understanding is that there was an update uh, from the Canadian uh, Health Public Agency over there, and they basically said, hey, if Canadian truckers, if you want to come back into Canada, then there's going to be a 14-day quarantined period. Obviously, you can't, you can't do that, um, right, you, you, if, you're, if your job depends on you going back and forth every single day. And that's what kind of initiated these protests. But, you know, to my understanding, and having done quite a bit of research before, before this podcast, it does seem like these protests have been relatively peaceful. Obviously, protests, you're kind of trying to make a little bit of noise, right? You're right. It's 18-wheelers. People are honking on their horns. But at the end of the day, that's what protests are for, right? This is a way for people to gather and show the government that they're not happy with what is going on or how the decision that the government is making is affecting them. I guess, you know, Jeff or Alex, would you guys characterize, characterize that any differently? One of the things I wrote about extensively in the book was because you could predict what the outcomes that would happen around the world if you allowed money to be manipulated and hurt some people at the expense of others, control a system, that that system needs more and more control. It needs more and more. It, the, the lie doesn't stop. The lie has to expand. And it has to take individual rights and freedoms away from... It, it, it gains control by removing individual rights and freedoms. And unfortunately, that's where we are in this cycle. Um, and... and and democracy demands peaceful pro- protest, protests. It demands um, it, um, people standing up to to essentially get the signal, um, so so that concentration of power isn't abused. And I understand a lot of people that are inside the system now are taking because it's hard to it's hard to <clears throat> see the truth through a through a system that it has has a, pol- a political bent. Or, or or any other uh, what what so have you, and so people are reading the mo- uh, news and taking one side or the other. I would I would go up a level and th- and think like this. When the printing press came out, 
there were there was a lot of there were there were very few people in control of a message and most other people believed that narrative as a printing press it reduced the cost of of technology so more people could contribute to see the truth and more people could access that truth we stand on top of that truth so more and more minds into the global co co collective and and it took away the power of the church for control and if you were living through that time now that time took a long time if you were living through that time it might look a lot like this time except for this time is supercharged because instead of having hundred thousand new minds coming onto the global collective both contributing and and, and learning and and finding that truth now you have billions of minds on an open network driving change and the truth lives on and the truth and the truth cuts through the noise um, but it demands people taking an active role and so what you have now is so people think it's social media that's the problem so social media is just an amplification process of technology opening up access for us all to contribute and us all to learn and what's happening in in society is 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 that that message is also breaking down power structures and that and those power structures are fighting back to control those narratives um and we're kind of living through that right right now but society grows as a result of of kind of that that truth finding its way to light um and that's what we said and, and that is all of human progress lives on top of that 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 Whole freedom uh, that whole freedom is an aspect of that happening in our lives right now i understand it gets politicized i understand that people take both sides but you want people standing up for truth it all relates to the idea of politics and for the first time we have non-political money uh, all money is political obviously fiat currencies are political the banking instruments that the fiat flow through are political the fintech that we use, whether it be Apple Pay or Alipay or GoFundMe, all political. Even gold is, is captured and, and is controlled by a small group. And I, I would argue that other cryptocurrencies are also um, political in the sense, in terms of the, the rules can be changed, modified by a small group. So Bitcoin isn't political. Uh, it, it, it cannot be politicked. Uh, its essential rule set is um, its very identity. and it was designed with an incentive system so that the users have no <laughs> have no incentive to change that um, and the users remain in control and that's what makes it very different and and very appealing for things like this um it it, it it's all about perspective uh, when you looked at occupy wall street there were a lot of people who thought that occupy wall street protesters were disruptive dangerous um, annoying, blocking the subways, making it hard for me to get to work, whatever it is. Uh, I, I was living in New York at the time and I heard a lot of that. Um, there were other people who thought it was inspiring and, you know, even, even though there wasn't really a coherent goal that, that, that there, clearly there was something wrong with the system. And whether you are upset about capitalism or, or the government bailing out banks, you know, there were obviously two, two different kind of, um, uh, angles that that people were kind of looking at when they were looking at occupy um you know there were people who sought to discredit it as a protest movement and they were there were people who sought to say that it was a protest movement same exact thing here today of course right um you have a mass peaceful protest movement by and large and you have some people saying it's not really a protest movement because they don't agree with the politics of what's happening and then you have other people saying this is super inspiring this is awesome so you're always going to have that and the point is now we have money that can rise above that, whereas we didn't before, and and that's a really big deal. Yeah, I think I think there are a couple interesting. I love I really like the comparison to Occupy Wall Street, and I think there are two things to point out there. Occupy Wall Street, you know, if if you actually attended the the uh, you know the demonstration back down in the financial district, it did feel kind of like this haphazard. You weren't really sure what people wanted. We we got rhetoric from that movement: the ninety nine percent versus the one percent. But in general, the response to Occupy Wall Street was extremely 
different. Obama actually came down and said, hey, I understand and I see where you're coming from. And if you compare that to Justin Trudeau's response to the, the, the movement, which is this is a fringe movement. This does not represent Canada. And I'm just not 100 percent sure that that's accurate. Right. Well, well just to, that's very political, though, because there are a bunch of Republicans who were like attacking the Occupy Wall Street protesters as hippies or whatever. Uh, even though some progressive Democrats were like trying to look, trying to posture as supportive. Obviously, you have some Canadian politicians who are saying this is awesome. And then you have mm. Trudeau and, and his liberal colleagues saying uh, seeking to discredit it and basically saying, look, Canadian, I saw what he said yesterday. Canadians have a right to protest, but this is enough. I mean, what? No, it's never enough. That's the whole point of protest is that it needs to be protected in, in a democracy. Um, and financial censorship is, is one of the key ways through which governments will attack the ability to protest. They did it in Hong Kong. They're, they tried to do it here. They're going to try to do it everywhere. Um, now we have a way around that. And, and that, that allows us to get out of this political dimension where every time a group of people peacefully try to push back against the government, one half of society is going to say they're LARPing or that the, the, they have an agenda or they're not, they don't count. Um, it's sort of, you know, let's, let's, we can end that now because, because now people can, can finance themselves without needing to, to deal with that. And Alex, that point is, and it creates an opportunity, a wedge issue for the other side of government to polarize society further and, and advocate. And so, so what, what ends up happening in this is society gets played over and over and over back, back and forth. And what Alex is talking about, and I think that's exactly right. You have a, you have a money or a Bitcoin, a network that rises above the entire, uh, the entire uh, political system. And that's the, and, and, and it doesn't care. It, it, it doesn't care what side of the issue you're on. And significantly, gentlemen, um, you may or may not have seen this, but today was the first break I've seen in the Liberal uh, caucus uh, where an MP from Quebec, very well-spoken French-Canadian, spoke in English uh, about how he doesn't agree with the politi politicization of the vaccine issue and the divisiveness of the Liberal Party. This is the first break in the sol solidarity of the Liberal Party that I've seen. He was speaking alone, but he made reference to other uh, people within the Liberal Party that uh, agree with him. Um, it'll be interesting to see how Trudeau deals with that because, um, again, they've been pretty uh, uh, single message, which is, you know, ex fringe minority, extreme right wing, anti-vaxxers. Um, but this guy said, look, it's not anti-vax. It's, it's, it's a bigger picture. And then... Significantly yesterday as well, and probably one of the greatest speeches I've seen, I'm not sure if anyone saw the security detail officer, uh, personal security officer of, of Trudeau for the last 15 years, Colonel Bulford, resigned his position and gave a 10 minute, well, the, the speech that I saw was 10 minutes long. And it was absolutely incredible. His wife doesn't agree with the uh, Vax mandate and uh, it was putting pressure on their family. So he resigned and basically said a phrase that'll stick with, with me forever. He said, courage takes practice. So courage takes practice and he's not going to comply with what he viewed as the wrong treatment of citizens by the RCMP. These are huge statements. And we have a Charter of Rights and Freedoms in Canada, which is probably our most important document after the, uh, uh, well, it's, it's just an incredibly important document for the rights and freedoms of Canada. And he detailed section by section that the police have been abusing people who have chosen not to take a vaccine. And that is in direct contrast to what the Charter of Rights and Freedoms in Canada was uh, st st stands up for. So it was quite, quite. <clears throat> uh, it was brilliant. He he broke down a number of times. Um, my my wife watched it. She she was crying. The point is, uh, you know, here we are raising funds, Jeff, for the truckers. But I would be as a signatory on those keys. I'd be open to making a small donation to his family and the future of his family. Uh, for you know, and I don't want to bring political sides in against this, but there are so many families that have been torn apart and have taken vaccinations or decided not to and lost their jobs. 
including a number of the police force in Ottawa. So th this is a very, it's a, it's a bit of a powder keg. The truckers have absolutely committed to being peaceful, but you never know when, a, you know, when, the, when the, the testosterone flows and someone's pushing you with a baton and everything, we'll see what happens. So I really, really hope it remains a peaceful protest, but these trucks are not going anywhere. I, I, I would also just add that it's important to recognize that in this case, the, what these truckers are doing is, you know, something that the government doesn't like, right? And that obviously mm -hmm. leads to the, the freezing of, of the GoFundMe and other various financial restrictions. Um, you know, that is going to be the case everywhere where you're gonna have many different contexts. I mean, we have a particular um, story we're talking about today with a particular set of characters in a particular country. Um, but at the same time today, you had a big Wired article come out about Ukraine and how Ukrainian resistance to Russia is being funded uh, through Bitcoin as well. Um, so that might be a totally different take where you might have someone who really hates the truckers, but really also, um, you know, doesn't doesn't like, you know, doesn't like Russia. And, and it's like, oh, this is kind of interesting. So, you know, Bitcoin being not political will end up serving the aims of a lot of different people um, who don't necessarily agree with one another. Um, it's basically a resistance technology um, to resist financial control of the of a, of a of the establishment, and that's going to manifest in many very interesting ways over the next few years. Yeah, and and Alex, I know you talk a lot on this, and I do as well. But if you think about the Uyghurs in China, or or um, there's a there's a message that the political establishment in China doesn't want out. Of, of, of <laughs> right. China. Um, yeah. and and there's a and and it's it's it, and and there's and the more and more that you're stuck into that message you could believe that message too um it, and it it affects you and it's a controlled message and once that control and and you essentially you stomp out opposition to your message through financial or otherwise means um society looks really different and so, so I think about I th I think about how important Bitcoin is as a break from that absolute control, um, and it it's it it's way more important than people realize as a result of that 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 resistance it it puts because that power that power comes at our expense our individual rights and freedoms are lost on a on a concentration of that power and I and, and Bitcoin is actually the only thing that I've seen. That restores that balance. People don't think often in terms of governments around precedent and checks and balances in general. Um, I would say if you go back to the way the Constitution was written, there was a very intentional uh, set of trade-offs, right, between checks and balances between different branches of the U.S. government in general. And uh, I, I think you, I think the right way to think about this is that there's no Shangri-La, right? You're always accepting trade-offs, and you know sometimes when you enforce freedom of speech you're enabling people that you really don't like to speak but we view that as a really that's the whole point uh if you if you liked what they were saying then you wouldn't need to have that rule in the first place so i think this is a really this is this to me stood out as a really interesting example for why uh the financial system and sovereign nations should be more separate i think because to alex's point what's different here is that let's say if you contrasted the occupy wall street movement with uh, the freedom convoy is this is this is a message that the Canadian government doesn't really like, right? And uh, you know, to to put myself in the situations of the folks at GoFundMe, I mean, there's a lot of people, you know, myself included, that I kind of had this knee jerk reaction, like I can't believe this, like how could you possibly cut off funding to these people? The Overton window has shifted so far, but if you look into mm -hmm. it, they were going to get called in front of Canadian Parliament, you know, and have to answer for funding, you know you know, pretty serious accusations of crimes. Like if I were in their situation, if I were in their shoes, I'm not sure I could make a different decision to be completely honest. So I think, you know, when we're bringing up Bitcoin here, you know, we're putting in place a system where these two, you know, the government's interests and money are very separate so that the financial system can't get weaponized. I think that's, tell me if that's the right point to take away, Alex, from what you were kind of saying there. Well, I, I think that it's just, yes. And I, I think it's important to recognize where we are technologically in this, um, uh in in the time frame we came from a place where 
it was very it was it was a lot harder in terms of time and effort to do stuff like this because money wasn't digital um and then we were in this weird era in the 90s where kind of anything went um and and now now we're we're developing over the last 20 years uh we've seen the the consolidation of centralized financial digital services and and the ability of the government to to pressure um as we see here and the deplatforming is really picking up right it wasn't even really a word 10 years ago right it's 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 we're starting to accelerate um this trend both for bank accounts and for uh social media uh accounts right i mean obviously the rogan um debate is is just you know bubbling over in the united states right now right um depending what you how you think depending again depending on politics depending on what you think about him you're on one side or the other right um the fact is he's going to be looking into platforms that allow him to do what he wants to do nonviolently and have dialogue uh without government freezing you know his stuff like and 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 guess what we're, we're heading in that direction and if you just take bitcoin out of the picture we're looking at a future that's just like more and more and more susceptible to social engineering and deplatforming. i mean we're heading into a world where governments are more there's more precedent for stuff like this like is what you're getting at like oh they oh they froze the truckers go fund me i mean you know i think you would you're going to see a lot more of that in the next year like uh, on both on both in canada and the united states and elsewhere um and that's just going to get increasingly sophisticated and widespread obviously in china it's like hugely sophisticated i mean if you send the wrong jpeg to somebody in your family your bank account gets shut down um if it, if it could be construed as like a symbol of tiananmen square or something like that uh they have like imaging analysis and insta analysis hooked up to your financial account so but that's that's been the case for years there that doesn't quite exist yet in america yet um but look every time you send a venmo payment in the united states it literally says that this could be frozen you know it reminds you right there uh over how little control that you have uh, over your transactions, so you know, without Bitcoin, we're 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 headed to a bad place um, where the people who rule society get to determine uh, everything about about speech and protest. So I really do think that Bitcoin is is hugely helpful to help save our democracies and to help save our open societies. And the other note I would just leave is that um, today it's possible that other digital assets can actually play this role. Um, because we're just sort of at the beginning stages of this. And a lot of pressure hasn't been put on these other assets as well. Um, you started to see blacklisting, of course, on like Tether and, and, and things like that. Um, that's over the next decade just going to accelerate. We're really going to start to appreciate what, how Bitcoin is unique. So what I guess what I'm saying is that you're going to see increased um, censorship of all kinds of digital money. And then over time, it'll become more and more clear how special Bitcoin is. And and that, and that's hard to kind of tell right now because we're so early. But in 10 years, I think it'll be pretty obvious. On that basis, and this is something I learned from the truckers uh, that, uh, so the, the convoy uh, has three spokespeople. Uh, one is Tamara Lich, who is a uh, actually an indigenous Canadian, a Metis. And then the main spokesman is this guy, Benjamin Dichter, who is one of the fiduciaries or key holders of our multi-sig wallet. And he told me a story about that concerned him when he was coming back from uh, a trip to the United States. Um, and he uh, flashed his QR code. Uh, oh, sorry. He gets to the, the, the uh, border crossing and he shows his QR. He's about to show his QR code to the border agent. And the border agent says, oh, don't worry about it. We've been following you with your we've been tracking you with your cell phone you don't even know you need to show me the qr code when you cross the border because i know you already have a qr code and uh you know that's been picked up by us tracking your cell phone uh, monitoring your uh, your movements on your cell phone signal so that concerned him and it brings you know to alex's point about if you think that the gofundme situation is concerning just wait until you understand what they can do with central bank digital currency and the tracking and surveillance that could take place there so you know that's that's an aside not just an aside it was an interesting story that the usa didn't want to have to implement that technology and it was canada that gave it to the border crossing guards uh 
And the U.S. had said, oh, this is interesting. This is technology that we can track our citizens even even more now. So there's a, there's definitely a concern on that front. Um, Benjamin Dichter is a, he's the one that goes on Tucker Carlson. I'm not sure if you've seen his interviews on Tucker Car Carlson, but very interesting guy. And, uh, uh, you know, they have good lawyers, good representation, trying to do this diplomatically. It's a uh, it's an interesting and well thought out uh, protest. Let's let's be very clear on that on that front. One thing that I would just add as well here is what flagged this case for me at least is because it seems like for me the Overton window is shifting a little bit. And in case anyone listening to this thinks, oh, this is paranoia and stuff like this, this has actually been part of foreign policy control of the financial system for a long time. We have sanctions; it's right out there in the open. We don't hide it. We exclude other countries from the financial system that the U.S. largely controls or has influence over. Domestically, this has already seeped into policy. There was Nick Carter's done a great job of highlighting Operation Choke Point, which was actually a, an operation that the Department of Justice ran back in 2013. And you can look, they targeted uh, a whole bunch of different industries, which no one would really want to stand up for, right? It's like escort services, ammunition sales, payday lending, all these very- Marijuana. Marijuana. That's a pretty good. That's a pretty good one, which is cross the Overton window. But it was all these industries at the time that no one wants to stand up and say, "I support, uh, you know, payday lending." Right? No, no, no one's well, raise like Obama, wait, but like Obama supporters didn't want to support firearms and marijuana, but a lot of other Americans did, right? And that's one of the reasons choke point was. It's so interesting, and I'm glad Nick is focused on it because it was so overlooked. I mean, it wasn't really something that most Americans knew was happening. Yeah, funny, and this just takes me back. So I've been—I was speaking probably a year ago, a year and a half ago with British military, and and multiple times the British military, and as they understand what's happening, because the entire system is built on a lie, and that lie is where inflation is required for a productive society, and and it's not true. It's required to protect debt from from and 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 so it. And, and as technology moves the other way, it has to keep on driving more and more concentration of power. And as you drive more and more concentration of power, the lie has to grow. <clears throat> Everything is connected to that. And so the Brit British military, as they understood this from the, my thesis, started to realize <clears throat> we, we're, we're worried about having to use a military on our own citizens because, because the concentration of that power has to has to drive more and more concentration of power uh, power and as citizens rise up they will be they'll be stomped down this is this is going back a long time ago and continue and so and, and so how far are they in bitcoin and everything else but this is a known this is a known that is that is expanding and and when you, what you're talking about right now is more people are and and i think bitcoin is is kind of that vehicle that's allowing people to see what's happening but more people are, are are starting to see the truth and when one lie is exposed that is kind of everything else a lot of people look and say what else am i being lied to about and yeah. they're standing up and they're standing and they realize society global what ends up happening to society when they're manipulated for control um, out of that, out of a lie, you could see what ha would happen to people, and a whole bunch of people might not know it. They'd be on one side of this debate or another and not understand it at a root root cause. But there's a lot of people that, again, this debate, forcing this debate into the open, forcing this you know, with Bitcoin. Okay, propose another system that is not based on a lie. Propose an alternative. That is not that is based on uh, on the truth, and let's talk about it. But seeing none, more and more people are starting to get exposed to this. They realize how important it is. This episode is brought to you by Fireblocks. I talk to a lot of fast-growing crypto-native funds, crypto banks, exchanges, and the like, and they all tell me they have the same two problems. One, their treasury management setup sucks. They've got analysts wasting time and money on manual transactions. Two, they are not happy with their current security setup. They're sharing passwords, they're sending test transactions, and they're worried that their funds might be at risk. Fireblocks is a platform that solves all of that for you. They're a one-stop shop portal, which automatically plugs into exchanges, trading venues, etc. They source deep liquidity and solve everything from day-to-day -day crypto transactions all the way down to complex DeFi strategy. 
And the best thing about Fireblocks is that they offer scalable solutions with industry leading technology. Doesn't matter if you're a two person crypto fund or a 2000 person crypto exchange, these guys have you covered. And the last thing that I'll say about this company is that I have known them for years. They are a high integrity team. They ship product like no other. I would trust them with my own funds. So click the link at the bottom of this page and tell them that I sent you. Very, very important that you click the link at the bottom here. Otherwise, they're not going to know that I sent you. And then how am I going to get credit? So help a brother out. Click the link at the bottom of this episode. Tell them I sent you. I feel like detractors against Bitcoin sometimes tend to mock Bitcoin by saying it's a religion, it's a political movement. And I actually think that's a huge thing that it has going for it, because at the end of the day, you know, Bitcoin tries to abstract away in a lot of ways human, uh, you know, the, the worst aspects of human nature. But I think one of the best things that Bitcoin has going for it is it's got this community of people with shared values. And I'm starting to see, like... One of the great things that I think it's done or listening to, honestly, people like you guys, uh, that's why I love having these sorts of conversations is you made me kind of look at things uh, differently. And if I could describe my own thought process at this moment in time is, I don't know, I I kind of feel like um, it is a bit of a situation where it's like first it comes from my neighbor and I don't say anything because they didn't come from me. And it kind of goes one by one by one. And I just feel like finally this particular one was like, wait a second, I don't think that's okay. And then as soon as that realization kind of hits you, then you start to see the flaws in the underlying system. But I'd be curious to get your thoughts in general on if if you see Bitcoin as a political movement, do you see it as a uniting almost like flag or banner of people with shared values? Do you view the, the community part of Bitcoin as being not as important ultimately as the code and the math and the monetary technology? Or do you view it as just an equal piece. Just how, how do you view the the human element behind Bitcoin? Uh, I just, I, um, it's very unique, obviously, but there are some similarities to the early web where there was like a community of people who believed in this technology's ability to connect us across the world outside of uh, governments and corporations. Um, but over time, that just, the community largely disappeared because now we all use the internet, right? Every single, not every single person in the world, but let's say billions of people, let's say the majority of the world's population. Mm-hmm. I think that'll be similar in Bitcoin. Like today, there's this really strong Bitcoin community from people all over the world who disagree on a lot of things, but but have this one thing that they really, really agree on, that there should be money that's outside of the control of the state and corporation. Um, and they, they may disagree on everything else. They may disagree on the truckers. They may disagree on Russia and Mr. Putin. They may disagree on uh, fossil fuels versus renewables. There's a lot of debates. Um, they may disagree on exactly how private Bitcoin is and all these other things. But they have this like uniting thing. Um, Long term, I think it's going to be similar where in like 20, 30 years, like there won't really be a Bitcoin community, quote unquote, because we're all going to be Bitcoin users. Um, But Mm -hmm. for now, it's very powerful, I would say very powerful. I have met, uh, sorry to jump in front of you, Jeff, but I want to give my regular Jeff Booth uh, brother, (laughs) brotherly love hug here. Okay. Um, I I'm so grateful that I got into Bitcoin, uh, not because it's rescuing the financial system, uh, as I see it. And I wrestled with for 30 years in my old job. I'm so happy because I've met some really motivated people who truly are purely good people, uh, amongst which is my good friend, Jeff Booth, who we only met about a year ago. And then Michael, you know, this, we traveled down to your thing in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire. And I got uh, to spend eight hours with a guy that I could have spent another 800 hours with. Um, honest to God, uh, this community is so smart. The shared values are very important, you know, freedom, uh, freedom of expression, freedom of speech, freedom of money. Uh, all good. Um, and then there's the maxis you and I have talked about. And I'm, I'm actually joking a lot because on the, on the tally coin page, uh, I encourage people to write comments that, uh, well, I don't encourage them, but I don't take offense to them. Foss is an idiot. Foss is a plant. Foss is this, Foss is that. And you know, with the good comes the bad. Um, there's the, uh, there's some, uh, there's some Bitcoin maxis who seriously, honestly, at, at the Bitcoin magazine thing, I want to go on stage and have a, have a fight with uh, one of the, one particular Bitcoin maxi. And I say that we'll do it for charity. But uh, some of these guys are like, they're not the same. I don't have shared values with them. They have to be 100% in uh, their, you know, the world has to collapse. And I don't want the world to collapse. I actually want to develop a parallel system. I have three kids. I have no interest in seeing the world collapse. And I see this uh, 
parallel system developing uh, with Bitcoin that essentially makes uh, our children have the opportunities that I had when I was growing up. And amongst these people that I've met, just recently, Kyle Kemper, I'm not sure if you guys know who he is, he's Trudeau's half brother, but I met him in the last, uh, in the last two weeks and I was on a podcast with him and he is absolutely a very interesting man who has certainly insights about his half brother having grown up with the, uh, the Prime Minister of Canada um, in the young age. But these are, you know, this, they, we do have certain, there's absolutely certain values and, uh, uh, that, that permeate. And I just want to say one final thing. There's a guy, Laser Hoddle. I've never met him personally. I don't know who he is. I've been on podcasts with him, but he is, he, he keeps an avatar on a podcast. He has challenged the Bitcoin community globally to come up with uh, one Bitcoin donation. Uh, if he can raise 10 people to do that, or nine other people besides him, he will donate a full Bitcoin to the Freedom Convoy. And I've been able to raise a few uh, uh, local Canadians uh, along the path. Uh, I'm going to commit to that uh, to that uh, pledge as well. I just think it's remarkable that somebody on the other side of the world would donate to, and I, I think he lives on the other side of the world, um, would donate to this uh, to this cause. And uh, that's a Bitcoin community that sees uh, how important this is as a as zero hedge. The, the zero hedge publication said, well, GoFundMe just provided the use case for Bitcoin. And that's exactly what it is. This is a, the exact use case for Bitcoin. And then you start extrapolating that a little bit, as I mentioned, into central bank digital currencies and whatnot. And people realize, you know, we could be heading down the wrong path. So a great community, Jeff Booth's book. Here's my plug, Jeff, best <laughs> book I've ever read. And honest to God, we are, we are doing that because Jeff didn't write that book because he wanted to make money on the book he wrote that book he's he was genuinely concerned about the future well, he, uh for he, for, for here's our kids. the and cool so. part about bitcoin is that greg you're usually talking and mike michael mike you're, you're, you guys are usually talking about uh bitcoin as an investment uh bitcoin as a financial asset bitcoin is something that's going to uh start taking value away from all these other uh, assets that people invest in whether it be real estate or gold or whatever and that, that's that's the normal discourse for a lot of folks and mm. then all of a sudden this happens and you start to realize and remember that bitcoin is a lot more than just that i mean clearly that is what it is at its heart this sort of digital gold type thing that that has a value proposition that's separate from 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 fiat currency um but ultimately it has a lot of uses uh and and it fixes a lot of things and 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 you know your you know, retirement portfolio is not the only thing it fixes. And I think this is a very clear and demonstrable evidence yeah. of that. Yeah, Alex, and I, 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 that's a really incredible and tied into the other thing that Michael was asking before. I don't agree with everybody in the Bitcoin community. Um, I, um, but there is a certain thing that uh, that I uh, that I do agree with, and and I I agree in a free market, unless you believe that for that that you always see the future perfectly and and that somebody can do that for all of us forever then if you believe that then then concentrate all control into one person or a couple people and but mm -hmm. put a face on those people and decide who that should be because that's what that's what the world will look like um i i believe that we all make mistakes i believe that inherently Human beings are, 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 most people are really good people trying to find a way to, uh, to do what they need to do in their lives. And, and the result of that, if you have a system that is, that is built on, on corruption, you'll see the worst in humanity as it is it has to feed back on itself and more and more people realize it's based on corruption and they either hide in the system because they don't want to, they, they, they think that pr there's protection in the masses or they go closer to that corruption. Our system all over the globe is based on corruption. It's based on manipulation of money and control from some humans over other humans. And if people don't think that that has consequences, it has consequences and those consequences are just starting to emerge. 
It's going to, in other nations, they've emerged from a, for a long time. The, the, our, positive, our positive benefit was somebody else's negative externality in, an, in, a, in, a, in another nation, but it's exploding on itself. I believe in a system that, is, that puts the best of us, that is congruent with the best of us. And I think humanity will flourish under a system that's that's uh, that's congruent with the best in us, because because we will all make individual choices, that 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 are 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 better for all of us. Alex talks about kind of if you just think about that that system, forget the money going up, because that's basing that's basing your value on the existing system. You're measuring your value of this network tied to your existing fiat going up. What it should be is everything against Bitcoin will come down in price forever as you get more for less. And, and what that means is you could hate Bitcoin. You could, you could yell at it. You could be a political party that's against it. You could say it's sedition of, a, of the state. You could say anything. And the more and more people that are using it are actually helping you by, by, by bringing down, because, because a free market on top of that results in prices falling and humanity getting more for less. So you could hate it and it'll help you. I just want to respond to, to a couple of things there. One, Greg, your uh, outpouring of love here is why I wanted the two of you on the show. It makes my day <laughs> all the time. Uh, great, <laughs> excellent bromance. Uh, puts me in a great mood. Um, and, you know, Alex, that point that you made about Bitcoin being more than just an investment, you, you know, the very first thing that I thought when I saw the GoFundMe campaign get canceled was about the conversation that you and Mike Green and I had like three months ago or four months ago or whatever that was. And you were talking about, mm -hmm. you use this analogy of Bitcoin as a check and how the alternative party in Russia used Bitcoin to raise funds. I was like, oh my God, I, I'm seeing another example of this. And I totally agree. What, what, what I'm hopeful for, maybe not hope, hopeful is the wrong word, but I do think at least this for me was kind of, um, it was a very stark reminder that Bitcoin has uses outside of just being a financial investment. And now I think for better or worse, when there's censorship, uh, particularly when the financial system is weaponized, people are starting to associate pushback against that with Bitcoin. That's what I was kind of getting at with Bitcoin as a political movement. In the future, it's all going to dissipate. There's no US dollar community. <laughs> it's not like, hey, I mean, I guess yeah. the Americans, well, but, you know, <laughs> but right now it's I, powerful. I mean the, the crazy part is that this is what the dream was initially, which is eCash. I mean, it came out of the minds of science fiction authors and uh, early cypherpunks. They, they didn't set out to destroy and replace central banking. That, that was not their initial goal. Um, their initial goal was eCash. Their initial goal was being able to donate to the truckers uh, without the government being able to freeze it. I mean, that was their initial goal. Uh, only later over the decades did, did they um, figure out over time uh, and you know when Adam Back has ha you know had these realizations, and um, Nick Sabo and others, uh, and eventually Satoshi obviously put them all together. But that you couldn't get the eCash without creating a different financial system, without creating a decentralized mint. That was like absolutely essential. Um, but this was the original vision for Bitcoin. The the cool, mind blowing macro part about Bitcoin, this meta part, is that it <laughs> it ends up it ends up doing a lot more than just allowing you to donate to the truckers. It changes the whole world. Um, uh, but that was only a, like a realization later. Um, but I thought that was one of the most interesting insights I had after study, you know, studying the early cypherpunk movement was, was um, and, and my own uh, journey into Bitcoin started, of course, with this kind of use case, not the like, uh, you know, negative, you know, negative yielding uh, government bonds. That was not like what I was interested in. I was interested in, um, in, in, in fighting censorship. And then only later do you realize that you can't, you really can't do the fighting censorship thing unless you have a completely new parallel financial system. And the good news is we, we have both. And it's, it's, a, it's really a, a, a privilege to be alive right now to watch this happen. And Michael, can I uh, jump in and give a, a shout out to Michael Green? Uh, I met him at your uh, at your Blockworks uh, um, uh, event in uh, Bretton Woods, which was so much fun, so excellent. Hey, Jeff, it was uh, so well put together. But um, I met That's Michael Green without realizing who he was. And first of all, he could have squished me like a bug. 
The man is a monster. <laughs> okay. Terrific. And uh, he could have squished me like a bug, and that's okay uh, because sometimes I deserve it. But, you know, what I like hearing is honest criticism of the system. It doesn't mean I have to agree with them. And, uh, you know, you know, he's, he's worthwhile in the, uh, in the community because his concerns are real um, and they're well thought out. And I think that we always need to listen to the critiques, right? In, when you trade, never seek out research that confirms your bias, that tells you how smart you are for owning something. Always seek out the research that tells you you may be wrong. And uh, at least you got to listen to Mike Mike Green on that on those uh, on those fronts. I think these types of events, though, uh, even he must be thinking. I, I I can't put words in his mouth, but that you know, I I do have time for people who have constructive and thought out criticism. I just don't see another route, and I don't want to speak to the other guys on this panel. But this is our best hope, you guys. Uh, there might be something better in the future, but right now, this is the thing that I see rescuing the Fiat Ponzi. And I think this is important because I, I, I'm with you and you have to think about what the options are and uh, it, from the existing system and why technology always imposes a new system, mm. right? So the monopoly wins for a long time and then technology changes the rules and a new system emerges. But the, the rules don't change typically from the existing system. So let's just explore that a, a little bit. And, and you need a transition. And it, 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 I've said this a couple podcasts, but imagine today, to imagine in, in, in 2000, when Amazon was just kind of starting or just along, that all, all retail stores closed as a result of Amazon being better. Where would people shop? Because it was Amazon was such an early, early, it took time as a, on a tra transition. And now if Sears closes, nobody cares. They have, an, they have an option. So you have a transition happening at a higher level. You have a transition happening on a monetary system. But let's look in the existing monetary system and say, what are the choices? Choice one, stop printing. Just don't manipulate systems anymore. Go back to a free market. That choice has a cascading collapse of every because the entire the entire model is built on credit, and that cascading collapse of society, every bank, everything in society, has society effectively going back to barter, and then um, and and but there be wouldn't be food on the shelves. There wouldn't be it would be ugly, and into that void a population would vote for a dictator to change the rules because we are the we are creating the system so into that so let's just say a whole bunch of Bitcoin, we we want the system to collapse tomorrow and that, and and we want the fed to stop printing and all over the world we that's what happens and it keeps on unwinding until they go and rescue the system and that is based on manipulation of money path door number 1 probably a pretty bad outcome for society at large. Outcome number two is what we're seeing. Exponentially more printing, and it has to keep going. And along that path, a removal of individual rights and freedoms, and along that path, uh, the, the more and more so, will we concentrate power in very few hands at the expense of all others. That's, that's, that's door number two. And and you could play, maybe it's door number one, two, one, two, maybe you could cause a collapse and then come in and re save it. But out of the existing system, there, there is no other option out of the existing system. And what Bitcoin is over time is it's a, it's a release valve building a new system in parallel that is congruent. And yes, it's repricing everything on the way through and the people that are earlier are going to win more of that. But that's what's that's what's happening at a, at a broader level. It it restores individual rights, human and, and, and values, and, and a fair world. And so I kind of think about this system, and I think about where we are in it, and I think I would rather advocate with my time. I don't need the money. Um, I would rather advocate with my time. Hope, truth, freedom, where we're going. Um, and because I, I think about my kids and I think if I'm not doing that, what am I saying? Uh, I'm voting for an existing system that must 
go through one of these uh, uh, divides. I'm voting with my time for the existing system. And I want my, and if I just look at my kids, I want, uh, I, I want them to, did you say the truth? Did you tell the truth? You could have been wrong. You might, you might be wrong and you'll learn and you'll explore that. But did you actually stand up for the truth? How does it actually protect the freedoms and rights of people? Like in this specific instance, right? Maybe we can use this as an example, right? Access to GoFund, GoFundMe shut down their campaign. And maybe that was leaning from the, from the Canadian government. Maybe that was executives at GoFundMe. There was some cascading series of decisions whereby the financial system was cut off to this particular set of protesters. How would that work differently in a Bitcoin system? The Bitcoin way is... Um you know, essentially a rejection of the idea that money is Caesar's only, um, which would be, again, the world that we'd live in if it didn't exist and where you have things like GoFundMe and, and commercial banks that are just essentially, you know, creatures or puppets of the state um, at the end of the day, uh, and whether you know, because they're using dollars or Canadian dollars or whatever, those things can be can be seized and confiscated by authorities. So now you have an ability for very straightforwardly anybody in the world to donate digitally value that's important to this cause in Canada um, without any censorship or, or confiscatory fears. And that, that's impossible before Bitcoin. So it, it's a major technological change um, and, and a major monetary change. I mean, and, and, and it makes for a powerful political tool, I agree. When I say Bitcoin's not political, I mean the the governance model. I mean the thing right. itself. It can't be politicked, um, but it but it certainly is it can be a shield for people to protect themselves. So let's take the example of two different fundraising mechanisms. We've got GoFundMe and we've got Hong Kong Kodal, which I want to talk about, um, and TallyCoin, which is the platform. So you know, my understanding of the, what happened with GoFundMe is that they were basically summoned to speak in front of Canadian Parliament. There was the implication that they could be in some serious trouble for fund if this was labeled as, you know, to use an extreme example, like terrorist type activity, then they could be liable for that. And therefore, they canceled the campaign. Why could the same thing happen as, as signatories on, you know, um, you know, the Tallycoin platform? Why couldn't Greg or Jeff, they haul you up before Canadian Parliament and you'd be subject to the same political pressures that the, the folks at GoFundMe were? I knew the Fiat Ponzi when I started with the Royal Bank of Canada when I was 25 years old in 1988 and the Royal Bank of Canada was essentially insolvent because of Latin American debt, okay? Mm -hmm. But I'm 25 years old. Am I going to run to the Wall Street Journal and torpedo my career as a finance guy that has a whole bunch of school loans that I still owe to uh, Cornell University? Um, you know, no one's going to believe me, firstly. And then secondly, um, I'll never have a job in finance again. Uh, I've reached a point in my career where uh, I don't have, um, you know, I, I, I need to tell the truth. Like Jeff says, am I going to do what's right? So I understand a lot of people who don't want to divulge whether they're, they're, they're donating to these things. But the reality is it's a multi-sig wallet. Even if I wanted to donate it to what I thought was right, uh, there's two other people that have to agree with my viewpoint. Uh, if the government called me up on the hill, um, I would say I support freedom and uh, I don't see a problem supporting freedom of speech. If you have a problem with freedom of speech, then I think we better look at our charters of rights and freedoms. And I, it's difficult for other people to feel that when they have a job that they are worried, uh, much like a police officer, if he's trying to support his family, right? It's, it's, it's really hard to do that. So. I guess the, it comes down to a point where I'm not, you know, I'm privileged because I worked hard and I have some assets that I can rely upon and I'm okay just to risk, you know, what, what could happen to me. And I honestly believe much like my grandfather would have, I'm a hundred percent certain my granddad would have done the same thing. And for the record, my granddad has been awarded the Order of the British Empire. It's a very prestigious medal for honor, honor and bravery. Only 800 non-British citizens have been awarded that medal and my granddad was one of them. And so my granddad's tapping me on the shoulder and he's saying, hey kid, it's your time. Um, so to give a, a corollary also, um, that's somewhat similar in, in Belarus, uh, the um, labor movement was very important over the last couple of years in pressuring the regime and it continues to do this because there's a huge number of public sector workers in that country um 
and they wanted to stop working to put pressure on the regime, but they needed to put food on, on the table for their family. Um, so they would uh, receive Bitcoin donations from abroad. The financial system itself was highly compromised. So the interesting part is that they were able to maybe start a circular economy of sorts where they could start actually sending money to other people in Bitcoin without having to go into fiat, uh, mm. et cetera, et cetera. So you wonder what, what happens here, Greg, because you, you guys are raising this money and it's in Bitcoin and you know, maybe maybe the support that you give to the community, you know, doesn't have to be cashed out into CAD. You know, m m maybe some of those gifts end up being in Bitcoin, and then it, it spreads from there. And that that's kind of where we're headed as a world where we get we get further and further away from the fiat system, um, which is really the dream, right? In my previous role in business, be before I wrote the book, I actually thought uh, what would what was happening now would happen to me when I wrote the book because it was such a controversial controversial premise that that went against the existing world order it, it was it was true and it's accelerating but it would get uh, but it, but people wouldn't understand it and I thought I would be kind of shut out from the business community everything else because of that cont controversial stance Trudeau and his government many of the were the first people who received that book um, and they ignored it. And I tried everything to push it through. And not only ignored it, um, and, and so so to say that that they don't know what's going on, and it's actually partially what I, I, I realized, it can't be fixed from the system because the system is, the, is, is what's happening. Um, so, and I just wanted a, a first principles debate on, on how could we move society forward. That's what all I was uh, wondering for. Might be wrong, but let's have a first principles debate on how to move societies uh, forward. And and I got sh effectively shut out of that debate. But but again, when something cuts through that debate and it's true, other people jump on, and they start to debate it. And and you c and and it becomes signal through a, through a noise. And that's what's happening to, today. You cannot you cannot shut the truth out. You can try, but it finds its it's find it, it finds its way, and all of these different kind of islands, whether you agree on one side or the other, of the uh, of, of these kind of islands of information, kind of fighting through this. That's really what's happening to uh, through society. They're starting to break through, and Alex might have seen it from a social from a social angle. How do I solve this problem from a social angle? I I saw it through. Wait. If, if technology is creating um, lower and lower prices and I'm automating things and making it easier and easier, why aren't prices falling? And so that's the way I, found, uh, I saw it. Greg might have seen it through the existing system is going to collapse because bonds, uh, bonds don't make any sense. And everybody sees it through their own lens of how, how, what, what's happening, but actually kind of, kind of once you see it, you can't unsee it and how it's connected to everything else. All right, guys. Well, um, thanks so much uh, for coming on, sharing your thoughts about this. It's an important topic. Uh, folks who want to um, find out more about this for themselves, you can link some articles and, and information here in the show notes. Um, link uh, TallyCoin and, and Hong Kong Codal if you guys want to go check that out too. And yeah, uh, Jeff, Alex, Greg, thanks so much for coming on, guys. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for you. having us. Cheers, guys. It's been great talking to you. Thanks again, guys. Good day. Bye.